sweet. That's my alarm in the morning. Um, but they're sweet. And at this point in time, Jesus is, uh, he's hungry because he's human. And he sees this fig tree and he's going, oh, it's the time of year when these little buds are starting to come onto the tree. I can pick a few and have a quick snack. But what happens? He goes to the fig tree and there's no fruit. So what does he do? He curses the fig tree. And then some days later when they're walking back by the fig tree, the disciples marvel at how it's died. Why did the fig tree die? Other than the fact that he cursed it. It's because it wasn't producing fruit. In the, all the vineyard analogies, if a vine isn't producing fruit, what does the vintner do? He prunes it off. Fruit-bearing trees, fruit-bearing people should bear fruit. Let's take a look at Galatians real quick. Flip, what, three books back. Many of you should know this if you've been in church for any length of time. Galatians 5 and verse 22. <coughs> Paul says this to the church in Galatia. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passion and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying, the, envying one another. I want you to notice something. Paul really likes these fruit analogies. Is, is fruit there plural or is it singular? How many of you have ever tried to cultivate just patience as a fruit? Or just love as a fruit? Paul's point here is this one fruit produces all of these character qualities. It's like we are a tree, each of us, in an orchard. Or a vineyard, that's what Paul's getting at. Maybe we're a vine in a vineyard. And anyone who wants to partake, who wants to um, partake of love or, or patience or self-control, can pick these fruits from our lives and benefit from them. But if we're like the fig tree or if we're like the vine that doesn't produce fruit, are we any good to anyone? No. We're not. And so Paul's point here is in Galatians and now back over here in Philippians is that there is a fruit that comes as an evidence of the changed life in Christ that should be visible. Fruit is visible, right? You can tell a healthy vineyard by the color of the grapes. You can tell a healthy orchard by the fact that there are there's fruit hanging on the trees. We went down to San Diego a couple of weeks ago. And as you're driving down that I-5 corridor, what is one of the smells that hits you as you start to get closer and closer to L.A.? It's all the citrus orchards. All the oranges. It comes in through the A.C., you, you roll the windows down, it's 95 degrees outside, but then you can smell the oranges better. But you can also see them, right? That's how you know it's a healthy orchard. That's how you know that there's a healthy vineyard, because you can see grapes on the trees. That's how you know you have good strawberries out here, because you can see the strawberries on the plants. The Christian life should be no different. And here's uh, the fruits that are supposed to come of, um, he gives a different list here than in Galatians. But here is one of the things, here's what he says in verse 9. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Sometimes we think love should be separate from knowledge, right? Because we hear this, 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 this proverb that knowledge puffs up, right? Um, 
But love should not be separate from knowledge. Love should not be separate from discernment. What is discernment? Anybody? It's dividing the right from the wrong. Knowing what's good, knowing what's wrong, and applying that knowledge to the situation. Okay? Knowledge is important. This is how we can love the person who sins without condoning the sin itself. See that? That's discernment and love applied through knowledge. Verse 10, so that you may approve what is excellent. So discernment, again, is part of approving what is excellent. And so to be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. There's that day of Christ again. What is that a substitute for? The day of the Lord. Who's the Lord? Yahweh. So again, we're seeing that there's this rich Christology, there's this rich Trinitarian theology, even in this opening prayer that Paul has. So that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the, pray, or to the glory and praise of God. We are under construction, we are a work of grace, and we're a work that is to bear fruit. And that fruit is the fruit of righteousness, which is then demonstrated through knowledge and discernment in love. Working backwards through Paul. Sometimes it's helpful to like start with Paul's conclusion and work backwards. Um, so if you're ever confused about what Paul is saying, sometimes that helps. Um, what Paul here is, he, he loves this church. He is showing that this church is struggling. You remember what they're struggling with? There's two things we talked about. They're struggling with proto-Gnosticism, which is denying, one of the big things is that they deny that Christ came in the flesh because everything that is of the flesh is evil and everything that is of the spirit is good. And so because Christ was perfect, he couldn't have possibly come in the flesh Therefore, he only came in the spirit and only appeared to have died. Seeing the problems with this? That's one wing of what Paul is fighting. The other wing of what Paul is fighting is the Judaizers. The Judaizers have always been a problem <laughs> for Paul. These are the people who are saying that in order to be a true Christian, you have to first be a Jew. And you have to observe all of the Jewish rites and rituals and practices, and the law. What's Paul's main contention with that, though? Is that the law avails us no more because it has been fulfilled in who? Christ, who then fulfills it perfectly in us. So Paul is contending against these two groups, which is why knowledge and discernment and the the, the, uh, the appropriate application of those two things in love is so important. He's reminding this church that they already know what the truth is and that all they need to do is apply it. That all they need to do is exercise it and practice it practically. And we're no different today. We often think that we live in a society that is beyond the pale historically. And this is simply not true. Spend a day studying ancient Rome, what that looked like, and you'll be shocked. We don't have ritualized temple prostitution here anymore, do we? No. It's not like you come to church and, and worship on the altar in that way. No. <laughs> that was everywhere. It was a modern day practice that they did. They sacrificed, all, they had temples everywhere sacrificing animals all the time to appease the gods. We think we live in a culture that is expressly unique in some of the challenges that we face. But what does the writer of Ecclesiastes tell us? There's nothing new. We just invent different ways of doing the same old sins. But it's still the same old sins. It's still the same old problem. And Paul is telling this, this church, and by extension us, 
that knowledge and discernment, that this work that we're undergoing is what will see us through to the end. So here's your challenge this week. I want you to pick one of those, whether it's the, the under construction or the recognition of grace at work in your life or the bearing of fruit. Pick one. Focus on it this week. So if, if it's realizing you're under construction, maybe cut yourself some slack this week if you mess up. Here's a little secret. We all mess up. Yeah, I might have a background in the teaching and the application of scripture and being able to effectively communicate that. I still mess up. So if that's the case, cut yourself some slack this week because you are a work in progress. If it's realizing that this is all grace, realize there's nothing that you can do or can't do that will help complete the work. <laughs> it's all Christ doing it in you and you surrendering to that work. It's, uh, it's like uh, I heard somebody talk about, uh, there are two, there's two analogies. One is oftentimes we don't want to be the navigator in our car, the car that is our life. We don't want to sit there and let Christ drive. So we so often will take the driver's seat back. Okay? Don't do that. Let him drive. And then secondly, there's this house analogy where we've invited Christ into our house, so to speak. But there's this one room we won't let him go into. And we keep trying to redirect him and distract him to these other rooms. Like, look at how clean the kitchen is. Look at how clean the living room is. And he's like, well, I want to go in the bedroom. Okay? Oh, no, 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 you can't go in there. Here's the guest room, though. He wants to go into the bedroom to figure out what's in there so he can start working on it, right? But that takes a great deal of surrender to let him go in there. So... Realize that it's grace that is allowing God to work in you through that act of surrender. And then finally, if it's fruitfulness, I remember I told you don't pray for opportunities to demonstrate your fruitfulness, but pray for opportunities to demonstrate your fruitfulness, whether that's in service, whether that's um, through, through patience or, or love or those things. Find somebody to demonstrate fruit to. Be available for someone. So pick one of those three. Work on it this week. Because Christ is working in you, and we are to let others know. We are to show others the work that is ongoing in us. Amen? Yeah. All right. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. Uh, next week, I might have a little devotional, but there won't be much by way of formal teaching probably be a, a lot of stories being told on me, um, which you won't want to miss. Um, I might excuse myself for that portion of it. Um, but, uh, and there won't be Sunday school next week because we're doing the, the potluck right afterwards. So um, it'll just be a cool time of hanging out. We'll probably sing a lot of songs. Just have a kind of a, a good experience together, worshiping, celebrating, and having fun. Um, but... Uh, we will resume this in two weeks. And uh, if you uh, want to stay for the adult Sunday school, I would highly recommend that. Um, we're going through the book of Jonah right now. Um, and uh, it's been really fun to go through. We've had some interesting conversations. If you want to know what day Christ was really crucified on, come talk to me. We talked about that last week. Um, so you might, you might want to, there are things that you miss that you don't normally get in here because it's a lot more interactive. So I would invite you to come to that in the conference room back there. Uh, I'd love to see you. Um, but for now, let's pray, and uh, we'll sing one last song. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much just for this time that we've had together. We pray that you'd uh, help us to realize that we are a work in progress, that Christ, you are working in us. And I pray that as we um, come to grips with that this week, that you would um, just give us an opportunity uh, to demonstrate the work that you've done in us. We thank you so much just for this time together that we've had to study. We pray that you'd uh, bless us as we go, give us a great week, and uh, bring us back safely next week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Dave, for...
passing back so you can simultaneously be giving and singing at the same time. Be thou my vision. Be thou my vision. Okay. Paul Martin. Okay. I'm just gonna have to uh, finish with uh, Roger. I mean, uh, Richard. Richard. He's still working on his house. Well, he ended up uh, fixing a wall, he painted the, the trim all around around his house. <laughs> he painted his uh, carport, sidewalks. He just added, uh, added more and more. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, well, we'll get to the All right, we'll get to it. Let's just set the target. We'll get it up to near the court range. Okay. Yeah, we're going to work with that. Back in the day. Back in the day. Yeah, yeah.